here to tell you. So from the reptiles. No yeah. good can come from it. No one likes us. So here we are back once again. Round two with my main man, Ditch, from Criminal Outfit. How you doing, brother, man? Doing good. Doing good, man. How are you? God, I'm not as good as you are looking, my friend. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, last time we talked to you, that was fucking, it was almost a year ago. We, almost to on the nose. Yeah, we, um, we had just started doing what we do. You were one of the first, I think, three interviews I ever did. Yeah, yeah. But we had a different president. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A different bass player, you know, like everything. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in a different place. I don't know, you know, everything. A lot oh, of you shame. moved? Yeah, yeah. I mean, two miles away, you know. Oh, so you're still, you're still in Long Beach. I got you. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Um, so when did you guys, you guys got a new record out. It's called A Million Saturdays. Uh, it's like an EP, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a 12 inch EP though. It's six songs, 45 RPM, 12 inch. Nice. Yeah. I love that. That's fucking cool. I only have like two of those. One of them is lower class brats and the other one I don't know what it is, but those are those are cool as fuck 12 inch 45s, man. Yeah, um, yeah, you know um, There's this uh this custom fit record. I don't know if you remember them. Um, oh yeah. But, yeah, I mean they, they that's an eight song 12 inch EP that that that's what, you know, like that was one of my favorite records that came out during that that period. What was that, like 2012-ish, you know? And, uh, and I, I always thought that was like, the perfect length, you know? So Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so when did you guys start? For, a, a couple of these songs are from, were already on the demo, um, yeah. but there's several new ones. Have you guys got, uh, been recording and practicing mm -hmm. more material? Well, uh, I guess what I what I'm really asking is because it's the pandemic. I know you guys took some time away from one another. When did you get back together and start getting in the same room and writing and practicing again? You were saying that that your your guitar player has a girlfriend over in in uh, England, and his trips obviously right now are bookended by quarantines, and so practice was kind of uh, hit or miss. Uh, was here and there, so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've been, we've been practicing, we started practicing it maybe in, in May and then, um, we did recordings before one of his trips to England, but pretty much the exact same songs that are on the 12 inch. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we just wanted to have them, we wanted to make sure we had those tight so that when he got back, we could get back into the studio. And really nailed them, you know. And I think we did pretty well with that. You know, I think uh, I would love to be able to do that with every every time that you do a recording because every when the first time you record a song, it's like you're you're kind of almost learning it yourself, you know. Uh, sure. Yeah, of course. It's yeah. It's so funny how different it is. You can practice a song forever, but if you're not used to being in the studio like uh, a lot of professional musicians that do it, literally do it for a living. Once you get in there, it changes somehow. It's a little different because you have to break it into parts. You know, you have to have the drummer and the bass player play and so on and so forth. It gets it gets real interesting at that point. Kind of changes yeah. the dynamic slightly. Yeah. Are you playing at all right now, man, aside from your, your songs on here? I'm just getting started, just getting something else started with an old guitar player of mine and possibly a, another bass player I used to play with. But I'll be playing drums for the first time. I've always been the front man. Um, the last band I was in, I actually played bass. Every band before that, I was either the singer or or guitar or and and singer. So I'm kind of I've always wanted to play drums in a band. So I'm getting excited about it. I don't I I don't know what we're gonna do, but I keep wanting to do some some '77 style punk rock. I've always wanted to play in that type of band. Played it. Played in an oi band for ten years. I, you know, played in a D beat band and um, a grindcore band briefly. And I would really like to just play some old seventy seven style punk rock. <laughs> well, that'd be cool, man. That, there's kind of a shortage of that stuff right now. I couldn't even name like a current band right now that's playing that style. You're you're about yeah. my age. Right? I'm thirty eight. You're are you thirty eight, thirty nine, or? How, oh, I'm thir I'm thirty seven. 
37, okay. So yeah, yeah I remember probably, probably came up at about the same time in, in, the, in the late 90s. That stuff was everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. It was fun. No, oh, I loved it. It was it was everywhere. I mean, it was that and then like street punk and pogo punk. And 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 then like that 77 style came back in a in a, a flurry. Even Total Chaos, their records they put out around that time were were all that 77 style. So um so have you been writing any other stuff? Um, I mean, you've got this, you've, is it five, five songs? The five yeah. song EP? Have you That's got six, other material? Six songs. Yeah. Oh, I'm, you're right. It is six songs. Um, I, have you been working on other stuff as well? Plans for a full length at some point? We're thinking probably our next release is going to be a seven inch just because we're contrarians. You know, we do, we do everything backwards, you know? Um, Not so, but yeah, I mean, we've got, We've got two songs in the bag, and then we have that one song from the demo, Timing is Crucial, that we haven't recorded since. And I like it the way that we play it now. We play it a little bit faster at practices, so I'd, I'd like to do that. Uh, you know, that's kind of – we haven't settled on that. Um, and there's a couple cover songs we've been uh, toying with. We were talking about doing um, doing a cover of uh, Skinhead by The Strike. Um, okay. Yeah should be cool to do you know it's, yeah it's that's weird. a great one We're not playing live you know <laughs> being a band that we never planned on being a studio band you know so <laughs> like we had this set list that was like designed for like maximum damage live you know what i mean like, a million percent um, skinhead bands have to be you know what i mean they're either boring as fuck or they tear the roof off the place yeah, it's I mean, one or the that, other that skinhead bands felt like they had to be like that <laughs> A lot of the, a lot of bands are really happy, with looking really nice on stage, you know, looking cool, looking cool, and and being drunk out of their minds and not knowing their own songs, uh, you know, like, and also, unfortunately, I don't know, I feel like in the past ten or fifteen years, probably closer to fifteen, um, the audience has been really happy to just stand there and look good too, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um that I feel like that comes with the death of all ages venues, you know, yeah. older, older folks don't want to run around and punch each other in the face. Like kids do. It's, it's, right. it bugs me. I really hate it. Um, when I was a kid, there was, there was a couple all ages shows a week, uh, every goddamn week. And now they're, I mean, finding a 21 and over show, obviously right now is a pain in the ass, but finding a 21 and over show in the set on the central coast, at least, it is a deal in and of itself, let alone an all ages show. They, all those venues just got shut down one by one. Bad promoters not taking care of the place, not cleaning up, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's um, so speaking of being drunk out of your mind, um, you were, I didn't realize this last time we did it until after we'd done the interview. You're actually straight edge, yeah? I am, yes. So – is there anything in particular that drove you to be or drives you to continue to be uh, part of a, a straight edge, uh, part of the straight edge uh, movement or culture or whatever it might be? Or, or is it not part of the culture? Is it just your, it's just what you decided to do? It's kind of evolved over the years. Like when I, I grew up in the Boston area, you couldn't avoid that stuff. You couldn't avoid straight edge then. And I, I went through a little period in high school where, where I drank, but it was almost like a contrarian thing. I, I, I keep saying that word. but um, it No, was, but I'm with you. Contrarian's an important word to punk rock. I mean, <laughs> you've got to be the antithesis to something, don't you? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So my high school had over 30 straight edge kids. It wasn't, it, wasn't a big, it wasn't a big town, you know, but the straight edge thing was huge in the Boston area and in my town in particular. And I uh, kind of got a little bit of like a, a jockish mentality to it, you know. And oh, wow. so I started drinking in high school a little bit just because I, I identified with the skinhead thing more than I identified with like the straight edge guys, you know. And it just it felt weird to be straight edge and doing the boots and braces thing for a little bit. But then um, but I never really developed a taste for alcohol. And then uh, I was dating a chick you know, the high school sweetheart and like, you know, first time in your life, you're like head over heels in love with someone. And she was, she was already as a teenager in the 12th step program, you know? Um, oh, 
Yeah, yeah. It, and it was really gnarly. She really struggled. And uh, so I started drinking. I stopped drinking in support of her, you know. And uh, and then once I started looking around, all the older older guys I was hanging out with, especially the older skinhead guys I was hanging out with, um, you know, I was seeing that a lot of people just were not doing a lot with their lives, you know. So it became a pretty comfortable decision for me to not drink in high school, especially. And um, I think that I was really fortunate to to have kind of seen seen things from that perspective because, you know, like I I drink four cups of coffee a day off. You know, <laughs> like, like I used to be over 300 pounds, you know, like everything I don't, I'm not real good with moderation, you know? Um, so I'm, I, I think that I'm really fortunate. I never got a chance to develop a taste for alcohol. Um, so in my older age, you know, I, I love being around my friends when they're drunk. Um, I have straight edge friends too. Uh, but, um, I'd rather hang out with someone that's fun and drunk than someone that's boring and straight edge you know what i mean yeah or salty and arrogant and straight edge because lord knows there's plenty of that <laughs> and, and and not to shit on i've known plenty of straight edge people and the best people in the world they're a lot most of them seem to me to be funny and goofy and and intelligent but there's a fairly good cross-section of them that are just meathead angry blood for blood fans you know what i mean there's three types of straight edge there's like there's like the fun the fun straight edge kid or adult <laughs> that, you know, is, is down for, is down to do anything stupid. You know, they do the same things that other people do when they're drunk, which I, I like to think I, I fit into that sometimes. And then there's like the super snobby, pretentious uh, straight edge guys who, you know, just, just live to, to make fun of anybody that doesn't have the exact same musical opinions as them. And then there's the meatheads that, that, you know, never developed any sort of coping mechanism so they're just like you know take, taking out their anger on anyone within four feet of them you know right so violence is their drug now i get it because i that was a drug for me for some time i get it yeah yeah i mean dude like you can't be a skinhead and not be exposed to violence but like, you can't be into hardcore and not be exposed to violence no it's a violent culture yeah, yeah, we, we, we've all engaged in it at certain points in our lives. Like, you know, so I'm not I'm not going to come off and say violence is wrong all the time, you know, but I'm also definitely not going to come out and say violence is right all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and I, just, just like you, like like you were saying, you know, there have been points in my life when when that that became its own crutch, you know, um, and, and thankfully that never had any really like life-changing um, consequences because I know people who certainly did, you know, I'm sure I know that you do too. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, I could say, I could say very much the same thing in regards to drugs and, and violence because it's not like I've never done drugs. I love drugs. I don't do them and I don't try certain things because I know I would like it and that there'd be no coming back from it. Cause I have an addictive personality too. <clears throat> Which goes hand in hand. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to say um, your, your name's Ditch, but let's just suffice it to say, I know that your name is is a spud sucking nickname to beat the band, just like mine is. Yeah. So, so I feel like oh, that always goes hand in hand. I swear, the Irish are born with just an addictive personality. <laughs> so, um, do you have any? Um, any connection to your Irish roots? Do you, um, did you explore that when you were, I mean, you're from, you're from Massachusetts. You're, you're an Irish skinhead, um, uh, that you, you have to have had some kind of, I would assume, um, getting in touch with your roots period. If not, if, if it ever even ended, you know, I mean, that, that was like when, when I was a little kid, that was our, my family used to gather around and sing, Irish rebel songs, you know what I mean? Like that was like, that was, that's a very deep thing for me. And in fact, like, you know, it's funny cause we have, we have associations with, with the skinhead culture in England. Cause that, I mean, that is where it was born, you know, but you know, when, when I was, when I first got into OI um, and started seeing skinheads around, it was like, well, these guys dress like my grandfather, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. like 
my first scally cap was my grandfather's scally cap you know um same and, and same yeah yeah there you go there you go yeah so uh m- my older brother's very interested in uh in irish mythology and uh and we have a kind of we we have an ancestor that um was supposed to be like a a chieftain that lived between the human world and the and the fey world as they say in ireland you know and, and I, really, he's really fascinated with that stuff you know so um yeah i mean that, that that's like uh that's a there's still there's still songs that i'll hear to this day uh like four green fields or something like that i remember seeing my mom cry when when we when we say listen to that song you know and that that song still gives me chills on the on my up my spine you know um so also you have to figure i'm 38 in the boston area from you know cutting my teeth from what like 97 through like 2001 you know dropkick murphy's were a like that was a i would be any anyone that's my age that grew up in the northeast that said that they did not love the dropkick murphy's then straight up line you know what i mean so like <laughs> that was that that was actually kind of a cool thing because because it helped my father and I bond too, you know, because my, my 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 father would hear them playing those old Irish songs or, or referencing, um, you know, Irish Catholic culture and things like that, and you know that was that was a big thing for him. Sure, sure. I mean, it's the same for me. I mean, I started doing Skinhead sometime around '96, and that was when. Uh, one of the EPs came out and the do or die record came out and I lost my shit because this is when I'm getting in touch with the really getting in touch with, with my Irish roots and, and the skinhead culture and all of these things. And that shit was like, this is the most amazing thing in the world. Dropkick Murphy's that first, those first two records are untouchable to me. Um, Yeah. And, and yeah, they mean a hell of a lot to me. And I know that, a lot of people are like, yeah, they're just doing whatever. I'm like, well, they're doing what they want to do. And if you're not interested, fine. But I got no heat with anything they've ever done. I'm just not all of their records are interesting to me anymore. You know, um, you and I are not part of their present demographic, you know, but but that, and, and that's that's OK. You know, I mean, yeah. for, for what it's worth, you know, uh, Matt, their drummer is also in Hammer and the Nails. and fit for abuse you know that dude's never stopped being around he's never stopped supporting the scene like i haven't had too many personal interactions with him um but uh i've seen his band I, he used to have shows at his house when i was in my 20s you know so like he's mm-hmm. real deal you know like I, I can say that much not knowing him very well you know? oh sure um i i got a matt kelly story actually so this was about you remember you're my age so you remember back in the day you used to get uh, catalogs from bands, record labels, or what have you, that would just be a regular eight by eleven fucking piece of paper folded in three and sent in an envelope, and yeah. it would be maybe one or two pieces of paper with the different things xeroxed on there, and it would have pricing and all that stuff, and tell you where to send money and self uh, self addressed stamped envelopes and so on and so forth. Well, I wrote back to him, and I was a dirt poor fucking kid. So I wrote to them and said, "Hey, big fan." I asked them. I actually was a kid, and I asked them some stupid question about skinheads, which he answered for me. And then also, like I sent, I sent this in and ordered some pins and a patch and one shirt. And um, you know, he he could clearly tell that what I was on about was being a piss poor kid. And he's like, I was a piss poor kid too. And I can now buy Fred Perry's because I work for them. And this like went on this, this, like he wrote me a fucking note back. It was a whole page note. And, and, you know, on some, keep your heads up, keep your head, uh, chin up. And, uh, and uh, I can't remember. He told me some other fucking funny Irish, like joke or, or quip or something. I should have looked at, I didn't think I would have to look, uh, be ready for this, <laughs> but, um, I still have this fucking letter somewhere. And that just always, I'm like, this is a real motherfucker that really legitimately wrote me back, uh, right. to talk about being Irish, being a skinhead, being poor, 
all that shit. And it meant the world to me. And it, I mean, it just made me even more headstrong about the skinhead culture and all that shit. Um, so yeah, that guy's real as fuck. Big fan of Matt Kelly, specifically Matt from that band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nobody, there's nobody in that band that doesn't have the credentials, you know. Um, oh yeah. So you know, but yeah, Matt, Matt in particular, like, like he, he is, like you said, he's real as fuck. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So, um, so I know you're from. So are you from Boston proper? No, I'm from. I, I grew up in the Merrimack Valley, so about an hour north of Boston. You know. Is it somewhere um, around Newton? Uh, no, so Newton is, I believe, a little bit east of Boston. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, no, you're right. I, yeah, yeah. I did have a that that I did have a girlfriend uh, in Newton, though. Uh, so <laughs> I spent some time there. I spent a lot of time before I had my driver's license taking trains to Newton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm curious what you think about. And I'm sure you've been back a number of times. What you think about what the scene was like there versus when you came out here and what you think of the difference between the two now? So, I mean, the, uh, the crew thing out here is a much, is a much bigger thing, you know, in, in Boston, in the Boston area, there is one crew. Everybody knows it. You know? Yeah. Uh, here there's, you know, there's probably, you know, half a dozen, half a dozen notable crews, you know, and then a hundred other little, little tiny <laughs> things, you know. Yeah. I mean? um, so uh, you know, that was a, that was a bit of an adjustment uh, coming out here. And, and especially, um, you know, I've always been, I've always gone to shows all over Southern California. So I knew people, from different zip codes from me, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, you, you talk about anybody and it's like, oh, that guy, you know, you talk, you talk to some, two people will remind me of each other very much, you know, <laughs> but they hate each other because of a fucking 20 year old beef over, you know, something that probably didn't involve them in the first place. You know, it's, it's like, they're, it's like, it probably started with a drunk friend at some point, you know, and things got out of hand, you know? Um, oh yeah. Um, but with, with that being said, you know, Southern California, so Southern California skinheads are infamous for that stuff, right? At everywhere there's, you know, there's only a few other places in the country where, where it's like that, you know, and that's because in Southern California, punk rock came from gangs. Gangs didn't come from punk rock. You know, that is, is that is the best way I've ever heard it put in my entire life. Yeah. So, um, I I think that's unfortunate in a lot of ways, but I also, you know, I think that, uh, and 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 I'm not saying I'm not saying that I judge people for, for being in groups. You know, that's a reality for people. You know, um, but uh, it does it does it bums me out a little bit when when people that I really like hate each other, you know? <laughs> sure. When it's like you guys have the same haircut, the same fucking record collection, you know, same habits. You guys, you guys are into all the same shit, you know? Like, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it's funny. I mean, cause a lot of people that are part of the culture and part of, you know, the scene, uh, even like punk rockers that, that are, that are around, but don't quite understand the whole gang beef thing, like they go, why are you fighting with them? Those guys are traditional skinheads too. And I'm like, my, my, but I've got a good friend who's a crip. Let me put it this way. I have a really good friend who's a crip. I'm not going to say which set he's from, but he will tell you that if there is in the same room, a, a blood crew on the right, and there is a rival Crip set on the left, 10 times out of 10, they're taking off on the Crip set because they've got heat. They've got heat with them way worse. It's some betrayal shit. It's some, it's some you're out of line. You don't get to be like me shit. Um, right. And that goes, for, that goes for skinhead shit too. It's, it, that's really just a part of gang culture. It's, sure. But 
I think that at the end of the day, maybe this is a difference between that particular type of gang culture and ours. If there are, if, if, if two trad crews are in the same room and boneheads try to take the shit over, they will, I, I almost guarantee, come together and smash that out. That'll get sorted out first. Sure, sure, but yeah. if that's not an imminent threat, if that's not an imminent threat, they're going to beef with each other the entire fucking time. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean I've, I've unfortunately seen people people gather around from, from separate crews to take on boneheads and then turn on each other at the, <laughs> when, when the, drinks got, the drinks got heavy. You know what I mean? So Sure. Sure. But you know, Lord knows I've seen it too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, one thing that's really cool about Southern California is it's not that weird for people our age to be still in the scene. And it's not, it's not that weird for people that are much older than us to still be in the scene. Is that um, strange back east? Is that really? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was, you know, um, we had one guy, one old punk rock guy, Al Quint. He had the suburban blues zine. And he was like the only dude that you'd see at all ages shows consistently that was over the age of 30. Um, Al, right? From Suburban Voice? Yeah. 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 That zine yeah, rules. Oh, yeah. Great zine. Smart dude. Really nice guy. You know? um, but. There, there was a long time when you'd go to shows and there would be nobody over the age of 20, <laughs> you know, yeah. and he was, he's, he's been at it since fucking 1980, probably. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that, that's not, it's kind of like once you're done with college age, because college is another thing that's big in New England. It's not as big out here. Um, once, once you're done with that, it's like, you're like, you move on, you get married, you have kids, you know, you do, you you do whatever, punk rock, skinhead, straight edge, like that's that's it's gone. You know, that's an ancient memory by that point, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's a trip that it's so I mean I, I know obviously that happens everywhere, but I just didn't realize it was so prevalent over there that that's the most common thing is that everyone hangs them up at twenty one or whatever. Right. Yeah, I mean and, and I think that maybe with with our age group that changed a little bit. But when I was a kid, we didn't, you know, there just wasn't, there wasn't like a whole lot of old, older guys to tell you about how things were in fucking 1983 or whatever. <laughs> you know what sure. I mean? Sure, sure. So um, let's switch gears a little bit um, or back a little bit. I was actually meant to ask you earlier, but I, I went off on a tangent. I'm sorry, but I was going to ask you, where do you, do you draw inspiration for your vocal stylings? Do you, are you trying to go for maybe an amalgamation of sounds between certain other singers? You know, uh, the one that, the one that would be the most obvious that is not a conscious decision, you know, people, I'll, no matter what band I'm singing for, people say that I sound like Joe mm -hmm. shot. Ah yes, I heard it yep. too today. Especially on this on this new EP, I was listening to it again today, and I went, "Holy shit!" Like <laughs> it took a song or two, and then I went, "It sounds like fucking choke." So step on it. <laughs> slap shot. I got a slap shot tattoo when I was nineteen. That was like that was. They were the only band from when I when I was a kid that was still around that was still playing. But I've never. I, I certainly didn't start Criminal Outfit going like, oh, I want to start a band that sounds like Slapshot or I want to start a band that sounds like Stars and Stripes, you know? Um, but I, I, at this point, just have to accept it, you know? <laughs> um, but so I would say, I would say like my vocal style is pretty, is pretty natural, you know? With, with this EP, like Alex, our guitar player, really pushed me to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, but uh but in in terms of like the vocals i've been singing in bands since i was a, a kid you know so a lot of the the influences i take on are a little bit more uh on the lyrical end you know um i will uh the early angelic upstart stuff in particular and then uh mm. um that's, that may be a little bit more a little bit less obvious is um sheer terror you know i love i love paul from sheer terror's lyrical it's is the it to me the best in hardcore i'm not kidding on any level 
I, I worship at the altar of, of Paul from Sheer Terror and Rob Lind from Blood for Blood all day. Lyrically, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, I think um, the rest of the influences are kind of, it's just like, it's, it's combinations of things. It's like, you, you get to a point in your life where it's like, okay, this is like, when, when I was a kid, if I saw an oi band, they sounded a certain way, you know, and, and it was aggressive and it wasn't, I, I think maybe sort of in comparison to some of the things that were popular for the last few years, um, to some degree, maybe I'm doing the opposite of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, and, and, and some of those bands I like, you know, it's just that, that, you know, you get old and groggy and I'm saying I'm 38, you know, I, I, plenty of friends are way older than me and way more groggy, but <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like sometimes, sometimes you just go like, where's the, like, where's the rawness? Where's the aggression? You know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really poppy stuff right now. And some of that's really good. And there's some stuff that's got some like kind of metal influences, mm -hmm. um, which also actually I like a lot. Just, it's just not who I am. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not my subconscious view of like what this is going to sound like, you know? We get compared to the bruisers a lot too in, in reviews, um, which I take as an if if they're talking about my vocals, I mean that's like a a crazy compliment. I don't I don't have the uh, the range. Does you know? uh, so Yeah, Al's Al's special. Al's Al's got a special vote. I, I've never heard someone that can do the melodic yet aggro vocals that that guy does that way um I'm holding and, a note while he's doing it too right yeah he gets down i think he's he doesn't get quite enough credit for how talented he is as a vocalist um but or a writer as well um some of that bruiser stuff is pure poetry that shit's brilliant oh um, for sure for sure so I think if I honestly, I can hear, I can hear definitely some Bruiser's influence in, in the musicality of, of def, especially this record. It just comes through a little more than the demo. Um, the demo, the demo was great, but I got that. I got a very, I got an Americanized uh, feeling, a, a feeling for Americanized, old school 1984 secret records punk uh oi you know foreskins that type of thing uh whereas and this I one had the foreskins the foreskins are a big influence on you know that 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 would be a reference point for me right. uh yeah so, but yeah yeah you're you're right that there is the the ep is a little bit more rock and roll a little bit more a little bit faster it's it's definitely not in it's it sounds new you know it doesn't it doesn't it's not and we weren't trying to be a retro band with the demo it was just that it was like what what were we what were we listening to and and uh and sort of like i said that little kind of reactive side <laughs> you know so a hundred percent so it, this this last year has been been odd we talked about this uh a little bit when um when we did the last interview, but this had this quarantine uh, outbreak, Kevin Spacey bullshit just got started. So how's it been? How's it been this last year? Has this been a source of inspiration or has it just been a pain in the ass and a difficult kind of a dry well situation for inspiration? So, I mean, the songs that are on the record, all those lyrics were written pre-COVID, you know, and I actually, I think of that record as almost like, it's almost like a little snapshot. You know, that's why we call it A Million Saturdays. A Million Saturdays is a song about just going to Long Beach and going from bar to bar, seeing every friend that you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and that was like my first, you know, like the, the year leading up to, the, to COVID, like that was my life, you know? Um, and and that's where that's where we all, everyone in the band started hanging out together and things like that. Um, so now you know it's, it's like I think the the next 
the next release that you hear from us, it'll probably be a little bit more, a little bit more angry and soul searching. You know, that we've all, I think everyone has lost, lost friends during this. <laughs> you know, unfortunately I've lost friends in every way for, for during this. You know, I've, I've had friends die. I've had friends, I've had major fallings out, falling out with, you know, um, which, uh, again, I think if, if that hasn't happened to, to, to some, you know, um, I'm sorry, I lost you. You dropped out at the very end there. If that hasn't happened, yeah, yeah, that? sorry, dude. I, my uh, my bandmates are actually texting me about about the record going live, so this is very timely. But <laughs> uh, where was that? So yeah, I mean, I we I think that within COVID, a lot of us have had have had friends die, and we've had friends that we that you know are just dead to us unfortunately you know like they're still walking around with a beating heart but you know like mm -hmm. i can do with them you know um which is unfortunate like i don't i think um i've, I've really gotten out of my way to not to not fall into the like i disagree with you so i disagree with something that you said about one little thing so we can't be friends anymore which is unfortunately really prevalent right now but um, but also it's just really easy right now to lose touch with somebody and then, and then somebody does something out of line and it's like, it's, it's hard, it's hard to just move on from it, you know? Sure. So. Sure. And, and it being difficult to keep in touch with people as it is, I mean, it's very easy, but it's, it's not, it's more, more like, uh, it's difficult to be properly social with people doing things like this is cool, but it's difficult to maintain a relationship with somebody this way. It's it's Absolutely. more work. It's more work somehow than getting in your car and driving to someone's house. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right, it man. does. It's going to take an emotional toll on 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 everybody involved, and maybe that it contributes to the the loss of relationships. Lord knows, I have a few of them. I don't really lament them because, like you said, I'm at this point where I I also just like you, I I try to not just go fuck you for this one reason and therefore everything we're done. Yeah. But also if I, if somebody drops out of my life because I don't have such narrow criteria anymore, you must've fucked up somehow in a number of ways. And I, I just don't care. I don't need it anymore. I just don't need it. That's that. I think that's a healthy way to go about it. It's certainly more healthy than the way I was doing it before. <laughs> hey, really? yeah, and, and it sounds like it sounds like you've made a lot of good changes in your life man you know so that's, props to you yeah drink it drinking a lot less and and just trying to do more productive things rather than you know worrying about worrying about tomorrow with my kids and things like that so like, no i'm just gonna get up and do shit <laughs> yeah, you know so that's really like a big thing right now you can you know Everyone's going to be depressed sometimes. Everybody's going to go through really dark times right now. But at the same time, that's like the, how many times did people say like, man, if I only had time to do this, like, you know, like if I, if I only had time to learn how to, to shoot a bow and arrow, or I only had time to get better at drawing, you know, mm -hmm. like you got that time now, <laughs> you know, like, like you can, you can, you can, Mind you, with parents, it's a it's a completely different thing. Parents, you know, but but but, uh, but but still, I mean, I I I'm exactly along the lines with you. I've done this. That's what I it occurred to me that I've said that a number of times. So I've been reading more, and I've been, you know, working out again, and I've been doing this, that, and the other thing. And I know a lot of people have. I'm sure you've been doing something along those lines as well during this right. time. Yeah, it's important to recognize promises that you've made to yourself or th you know what I mean over the years. And well, if it's not important to you, then fuck it, but don't act like it is just exactly. Exactly. At some point you have to just come to the conclusion. The reason that I didn't do this isn't because I didn't have time. The reason I didn't do this is because I am me. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? like, I didn't learn to speak French because I don't fucking feel like it. Not because I don't have time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I just finished the first draft of a novel. You know, like that last night, as I was waiting for, as I was waiting for our drummer to show up to pick up our records, like, I'm like, oh, you know, like, and, and that was one of those things I was going through depression. I went through a pretty bad breakup at a certain point, which is another thing that everyone's going through, you know, right now. It's like, so 
I kind of had to, I was like, you know, I, I have to, I have to deal with this some way, you know, and, and what do I know how to do? I, I couldn't go out and see my friends, but that doesn't mean that, which would have been my, my go-to before, but the last thing I'm going to do is lay down and do something that's, you know, take up some kind of new negative habit or something, you know, like it's time, it's time for all of us to man up a little bit, you know, <laughs> like it's a, absolutely. So I, that actually was coming up a little later. Uh, what is, what is this first draft that you've been working on? Do you want to talk about it? Is it a novel? Is it nonfiction? I mean, right. It's, it's fiction right now. Right now it's of a, of a no, novella length, <laughs> you know, okay. it's, it's probably the first draft is probably about 60 or so pages, you know? Um, so I don't know. I'm going to probably give it a week and then start and then reread it. And, and if it's something that um, that I think is something that I can turn into a readable <laughs> document, you know, that, then I'll then I'll work on a second. Um, if not, it's something that was therapeutic, and um, and I'll drop it and pick up something else to write. You know, that's uh, uh, that's tremendous. I mean, I think that's an important. That's a very important attitude to have as any type of artist that not everything, not every scrap of paper you write on is, is your magnum opus. It's not all important. You have to be able to throw things away sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and as, as a writer, you have to be able to maybe not necessarily write every day, um, but you should be able to write four or five days a week. You know what I mean? And, and, and being and read. Friend, yeah. Oh, re reading too. Yeah. Reading, reading and, and, and just the, the, uh, the thing that's the most difficult for, for most writers is um, writing when they're not in the mood to people wait for inspiration, but you can train your brain to, to just to, to keep writing, you know, under, under any circumstance, you know, and, and sometimes, at the end of the day, you may end up hitting delete on three quarters of what you just wrote, but otherwise you're going to be waiting two weeks for that, that little creative spark. You yeah, but you, but you tried, but you tried right. it and that's, what's important. And, and, and you did get something out of it. You just didn't get everything you wrote out of it. And exactly. I mean, the, my, my favorite rapper, everyone that listens to this podcast is tired of hearing me talk about Vinny Paz, but he's my favorite rapper. And he has said, I mean, I've heard this said a number of ways. You just said it, but he said it the most perfect I've ever heard. He said, nobody I know that makes their living in any type of art form sits around and waits for a lightning bolt to strike their head in order for to gain inspiration, in order to write something down. That's not how it works. Everybody I know sits down every day or at least carves out time for themselves throughout the week to sit down and hone their craft and write things down. And they throw shit away constantly. They just, what they write, they keep writing. They might write four pages and of those pages, they're going to keep three lines for one right. song, you know? Right. But those three lines, you know that if they made it through that cut, those, those are worth it. You know what I mean? Exactly. I also think for a living now. So, you know, and I, I shifted my career in November. Um, just so I, could, I could get into that mindset. So I write eight hours a day <laughs> and then I come home and I write more, <laughs> you know? So, I love it. I love it. That's phenomenal. So what do you, who, can you say, who are you writing for? Are you? It's funny. It's a, I, I, I write, I'm a copywriter for two different companies that sell ropes and rigging materials. Like not, not like fetish ropes. Like these are like climbing ropes, you know? So, yeah. I write their blog posts. I write their um, product descriptions. You know the the blurb, their YouTube videos. You know, like that's uh. So it's 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 actually kind of cool because that's another. Le it's taught me a lot about you don't need to be passionate about about what you're writing. I knew I knew nothing about ropes before starting this. You know, if, if, and if I knew anything about ropes, it was. The fetish side, you know what I mean? Like, like that's the only that's the only emotional attachment that ever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's so, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't write about that stuff at work, you know. <laughs>
I, I do slip in a, a few a few jokes here and there. But <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. So, you know what? Um, fuck it. Let's switch. Let's switch again. I I actually meant to ask you about this last time, but didn't get a chance to. Let's talk tattoos. Uh, you 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 have uh, yeah. It looks like you have most of yours under wraps. Um, but when I when did you run uh, shows during when I'm wearing my shorts and sleeves, it's missing. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all right. The well, lighting's not going to work, but but yeah, but yeah. Otherwise, until until very recently, uh, I was working with uh, I was working with kids for years, <laughs> you know. So, um, uh, yeah, I I needed to be able to to cover up when I needed to cover up, you know. So, no, I understand. Um, but I was, no, I was curious about, I mean, when did you, wh how did you get interested into tattoo culture? Was it, or was it just, I'm going to do that is some punk rock shit or, or were you introduced to it by somebody? Did you get tattooed underage or anything like that? When I was a kid, uh, tattoos were illegal in Massachusetts altogether. They're not anymore. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, it wasn't illegal to have a tattoo, but it was illegal to give a tattoo. So um, you, you had to go to New Hampshire to get tattoos. And my, my first was just a stupid little straight edge tattoo, you know, um, and, and cost 50 bucks. I got it. I got it when all my other friends, when my friends started drinking, <laughs> you know, it's that contrarian thing again. I was like, you know, like if, if, if everyone's going to give up on this, you know, like I'm, I'm doubling down, you know? Um, so I don't know if I, I don't really see, you know, not not to say that I don't acknowledge tattoos are a culture, you know, uh, but like for, for me, it's it's like the the tattoos, all my tattoos represent a significant landmark in my life, you know, or something something that's influenced me a lot. Um, it's, I love I love good tattoo art, but I'm not I'm not the type of guy that goes through books of famous tattoo, you know. I got you. I got you. So yeah, I understand you're, you, you, uh, respect it being part of, you know, punk rock and skinhead culture, but you're not necessarily interested in the culture itself as tattooing. I get that. I respect it. I respect it, but it's not, it's not my, it's not my go-to for, for enjoyment. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Like, uh, yeah. sure. So, um, do, I, I mean, do you get tattooed often or are you just, it's either the here and there? It really depends. It really depends. Like when when I go through a significant something significant in my life. This this tattoo right here. This was right after Mickey Fitz died. I, it says "Fight the Real Enemy." You know. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah, that was a big deal for me too. That guy was that guy was the fucking best. I met him when I was like fifteen or sixteen, somewhere around there, and it was it was life changing because I always thought I'd be starstruck meeting somebody like that, and I wasn't. And he was just the coolest dude ever. And that was the whole, at a very young age, I realized just that I, because of that, I don't think I, and I've met a lot of very, very famous people, but I don't think that I can be starstruck because of that instance. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, he, he's the fucking best dude ever. Also fucking Irish. <laughs> Sure, sure, yes, yes, <laughs> but, and, but so the the business in the in the late nineties, early two thousands, they played the Boston area more often than almost any Boston band, you know, like because that was you know that 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 truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth record have blown up, and they really clicked with um with the guys in the Dropkicks and things like that. So they mm -hmm. they would play Boston because that's where they were going to make money. <laughs> You know, they were not. They were never going to have a bad show there. So I saw them so much, and that was so that was so defining to me about um, in, in terms of how I saw what music should be, what live music should be, what oi music should be. Um, Mickey was just like he he was the best frontman. You know what I mean? Like he wasn't he wasn't the best singer, but he was a great singer, a great singer. You yeah. know, but but you were not going to see somebody else his age that was you know, like flying around stage like he was, you know? No, I don't think you ever will again. 
not not in the oi and skinhead culture. I don't. The first time I saw him, he wasn't on stage when the band started, and he came from nowhere and bolted on stage and did the fucking Peter Pan gimmick. And I was just like, this motherfucker. I, I, and he was already wearing no shirt. Like, he was just fucking. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, here's, here's what was cool about the business. Well, he, one of many thing, cool things about the business is the business came to the United States. They were one of, they were probably the first oi band to extensively tour the United States from England. They came here and they saw American skinhead culture. And rather than turning their nose up at it, they, they embraced were like, it. things from this. Yeah, yeah. And so they watched hardcore bands. They toured with hardcore bands. They saw that type of energy, right? And then, and they they brought that. They brought that every night. And and you know, they hardcore kids loved them, and they loved hardcore. You know, and um, and that that was the fact that they gave that that respect was was super meaningful to to a kid like me you know a hundred percent yeah they they absolutely gave credence to the fact that the skinhead culture had progressed into america and it's become something different over here and they respected it embraced it went along with it um i mean i probably i won't get into crew shit but you know mickey was a good mickey was the fucking best dude ever and that motherfucker was the funniest dude in all of Oi. I swear he was. He has to be. <laughs> uh, I remember. I remember they played one of the shows that they played in Boston. They played with a, a band, hardcore band called Ensign. Yeah, played I remember them. them. Yeah, yeah. So someone from their entourage had a New Jersey straight edge varsity jacket, <laughs> and Mick, Mickey came out on stage wearing that jacket with no shirt, and. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm fucking straight edge now. <laughs> then halfway through the set, he lights up a cigarette on stage. He goes, I guess I'm not really straight edge. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's the fucking best. He's the best. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Um, so, so I do actually want, you know, you just touched on that, um, on, on something that, that, is it may be a controversial subject, you know, but you're talking about American skinhead culture as its own entity. And mm-hmm. that's, that's something that, that I feel very strongly about, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we have that one line in one of our songs, that's kind of just a, a wind up, you know, it's just it's a fuck with people. Are, uh, we ain't mods and we ain't rude boys. We love hardcore and we love boy, you know, which it's funny. I, I fucking love reggae, you know, <laughs> like but, me too. Yeah. I've got a quadrophenia poster on my wall. I don't have any beef with, with, with moms or anything, you know what I mean? But like, but that, that is what that statement is, is about. It's like, we're, we are an American skinhead band, you know? Well, let's be fair. Mods are wearing targets on their back. They're asking. That's for it. Very, very literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, living in Long Beach, we went, I interact with, with mod guy. There's a lot of mod, mod guys at the same events as us. They're all fucking cool. You know? Have no, no, no fucking schism, you know. But at the same time, it's like when when someone starts to to talk to me, like, why the fuck do you listen to hardcore? It's because I grew up on the, I grew up in the United States in the East Coast. Like, where the fuck, where where do you think I learned about about skinhead? You know, I'm not, I'm not fronting. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend. You know, I rode in on a scooter. You know what I mean? Um, right. It's it's like what, what, where was I gonna be exposed? At Warzone, Slapshot. Agnostic Front, you know, and and the Oi bands, you know, just the business being one of them. But mm-hmm. um, I'm an Oi skinhead. I'm a hardcore skinhead. I'm not, you know, and and I have an appreciation for every every different, uh, you know, iteration that there is out there. But I don't, I don't, I don't fuck with people. I don't tell. I don't go up to somebody that loves reggae and fuck with them. You know, You're right. And and. There, there is like a degree of of that that snobbishness, you know, that snobbery that that sometimes comes with like those ultra ultra trad skins, you know. And um, it's like uh, weird. Like if you really think about it, uh, I didn't I didn't plan on going on this much of a rant, you know, like the 
the first wave of skinheads in England that, that everyone puts on this pedestal, that lasted fucking two, three years, you know, mm-hmm. they were 15 year old kids. And then, and then that, that culture evolved very quickly, you know, like it turned into, it turned into other things. It turned into boot boy, it turned into, into suede head and things like that. And right. Right. And, but I would, I mean, I get, I get a little testy about that when, when guys that are sometimes, a lot of times the funny bit is it's not even older guys. It's, it's younger kids busting my balls for not dressing right. I'm like, motherfucker, I'm from Southern California. It is regularly above 80 degrees. I'm not wearing boots and braces every day. And wear shorts. Combat shorts. Yeah, right. I like that. I always like that that line a lot. That's the thing. Is like, hey, look, man. One part of the skinhead culture I'm not walking away from is the fact that we can fucking fight about this if you want to. Like, I'm not right. scared. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I I I like that you brought that up. I like that you pointed that out. The I don't like a purist from any culture or angle. It, it drives me nuts. It, it, it makes no sense. It's kind of like the people that get mad that hardcore doesn't sound like it did in 1982. I'm like, dude, not everything's negative approach. And negative approach is maybe the greatest hardcore band that ever lived. But they were around. They, they put out a couple of records. They were around for, you know, they've, they're still playing, which is great. Brandon fucking rules. But not everything's going to sound like that. What was that? I said, he's a funny motherfucker, too. I've, I've met him a couple of times. He wouldn't remember me, but I definitely remember him. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I'm just saying, like, things change. Things evolve. And it it doesn't – you don't have to be okay with it. But, I mean, what are you – you're just going to be old man River on the, on, the, on the porch in a rocking chair screaming and yelling at the kids about how they're dressing these days? Like, I, it's, it's fucking fine. I like wearing shell-toed Adidas from time to time. I like Nike Cortezes and Dickie shorts. I'm from Southern California. So I'm not, I'm not trying to hear this. I have to wear Levi's and fucking 10 eyed docks every single day. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. For sure, dude. Some, you know, there's, there's occasions where, you know, I own braces. I own boots. <laughs> yeah, I like them, you know. <laughs> no, I'm wearing my, I'm wearing my docks right now. I'm wearing Wranglers. Yeah. I don't even wear Levi's, but. I'm just saying I don't need to do this. Now, which is which is a funny thing. Like when I was a teenager, I would have made fun of anybody that had vegan docs. But here I am, fucking an adult. <laughs> you know what? I would have done the same too. I was a salty, jaded, ignorant teenager, um, which is one of the reasons that the skinhead culture made so much sense to me. Um, the violence, the working class uh, uh, culture, and all, and you know. All of it made sense to me, but now, yeah, I look back on it and I just, I'm like, eh. I mean, it's funny, but, but I, I've evolved and I think you have too. And I think most of us have, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was funnier when I was younger. That's true. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so, so do you, well, actually I'll fucking change this question up a little bit. Did you, you grew up in Boston in that area did you have – was there a big Nazi problem out there? I know that that one crew that's out there sorted a lot of it out, but did you have to deal with a lot of that at all? Not really. You know, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of politicking of, of, in any direction, you know. Um, so to the point where I think that after I moved, um, there was a few a – few, there was a shit you where know, there were people – that used to be non-political that shifted to the right. Um, so, and and I think unfortunately, like the attitude of of being anti-political, you know, I think that 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 paved the way for that because people people should have been called out that weren't. Um, but as a kid, we there was there really was not in New Hampshire. There was more there was more of a presence of that that type of stuff, but not not in not in Boston. You would never see like a screwdriver shirt. Or brutal attack shirt at a at a at a show, you know. Yeah, uh, you might see someone that at some point, you know, in that direction, they weren't going to be opening their mouth about it, you know. Um, sure. So, um, yeah, yeah, you see that. You see the same thing around here, kind. Of, I mean, it, it's kind of ebbs and 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 
and Wayne's. It, in uh, in Central California, there have been several crews that have cropped up, and they've just been beaten up until they wouldn't come back anymore. Right, but, right. But, but I mean, a lot of times by kids. If there's if you're a bunch of big grown ass swole steroid methed out Nazis, which a lot of them were, but right. there's only five of you, and there's a hundred. 15 year old kids that aren't fucking scared of you, you're not going to win that fight just by numbers alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. So did you, have you had issues with that? With, uh, I mean, obviously it's been a little while since y'all played a show, but have you had any issues with that in Long Beach or neighboring towns with uh bonehead showing up? Uh, I would I would not say, yeah, I grew up with, I, I, I lived in Orange County for, for a few years. So obviously that, that goes out saying there's, there's a lot of boneheads. In Orange yeah, County. there's a lot of them out there. We call the doll hut the Nazi hut for a reason. Yeah, yeah. There was like five, five to somewhere between five and 15 skinheads and then a few fucking hundred boneheads. You know what I mean? So, um. Uh, but in, in Long Beach, um, you know, at the, it's not not really a big a big thing, you know. Um, there's been certain periods when I wasn't really involved, you know what I mean. But but uh, I know that that in the past there there were some some uh, beefs that weren't. It wasn't so much like a, a bonehead versus versus other people but more like not taking Personal. part in it. yeah well that that too no yeah no. um but yeah i don't it's it's not like it's not like you're gonna go to a reggae night and run into them <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and and uh there's not a lot of you don't that's that's the other thing that i learned about when i was living in orange county was boneheads here don't listen to oi you know, they don't, they, they may be, there might be a few like RAC bands that kind of sound a little bit oi that they're into, but it's because of the politics, you know, um, right. what you, you'll see those guys at a TSOL show. You'll see them at an adolescent show. When Cogni Rejects played at Santa Ana, there was almost, you know, there, there was no major presence. Um, yeah. And if they show up to something like that, they're going to be dressed down and standing in the back. Cause exactly. it's not going to go well. <laughs> don't know like they don't they don't they don't have enough of a reference point to even know like oh yeah this is like this is something i'm supposed to like because i'm skinhead you know their reference point for 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 what being a skinhead means is um just being a nazi yeah having having no hair and being a nazi you know and and probably you know like their their stupid uncle that liked black flag in 1984 you know boom that's it. It's like, oh yeah, my my uncle loved TSOL. Like I should, I like meth, you know. <laughs> I like meth, and I like. <laughs> yeah, those dickheads like Pantera and shit, like a lot. You know what I mean? That's that's the it's it's. I feel like that type of metal is what they what they really. And I I don't like Pantera, but I do like a lot of metal, and and, and I feel like those motherfuckers gravitate towards it. I most of the boneheads I've ever ran into weren't at punk rock shows. They were at metal shows that I went to. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I think, so, I think probably nineties, that was even more of a thing, you know? Where, sure. So, sure. Um, so you being, I just found out, uh, you know, in the last day or two, when I was thinking about this interview, kind of went through your Instagram a little bit, saw the, the first draft gimmick today, got me thinking, so what is what you, if you're a writer clearly you draw inspiration from from something it's got to be books it's got to be films things like that so where where do you think um where do you think you might have drawn inspiration for your writing uh this novella as it as it exists now from movies television programs uh, books and if uh, so which ones like Nick Hornby as an author is a pretty big, pretty big influence. Um, and then, uh, you know, the high fidelity book and, and his other 
bigger book uh, about a boy. That was those were both the, the 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 what I've been writing is not necessarily punk rock related. Um, but sure. Uh, so there there's that, and then um, I, I would say I love a good horror movie. I'm not. I'm I'm kind of a snob when it comes. I'm not I'm not like I don't I don't I'm not really into B horror movies. Like I can watch, I can laugh a little bit, but you know, you you put on Rosemary's Baby and I'm like enthralled with that. All right. So. Uh, so you like more of an art house horror movie, as my partner in my other podcast would say, Parasite, Audition, things like that. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider myself like a horror movie fanatic, you know. But there is a, there are a handful of horror movies that I really love. Exorcist, Rosemary Baby, Rosemary's Baby, like those are uh, Poltergeist, you know. That, yeah. That sort of stuff that has a little bit more of a brain to it, and and uh, that's a little bit more of like that that paranormal. Um, you know, I also love Halloween. The original Halloween is great, but uh, oh yeah. So, so what types of what types of movies do you like to watch? You like to watch like old gangster movies, the English gangster movies, maybe. Um, uh, what what type? What, what if you are on on an average day? What what is the uh, what's the movie you're you're reaching for? Well, I also love the high fidelity movie, so that's one. Of them. But, uh, but no, like any of the uh, for for me being in, in the the VHS generation <laughs> you know like the the original star wars trilogy you know the uh um indiana jones and then any of the like the john hughes comedies like those are like that's like the gold standard for me um, sure et you know things that the, the same movies that i loved when i was eight <laughs> you know like karate Kid, but also the outsiders you know that, that it's it's not so much a genre for me it's more it's more of the era you know I think so it's, that, nostal it's nostalgia more than anything. There's that, but then there's also just a, I think that, that there was a, a style of, um, of the way that like narratives were presented in the eighties. Okay. You know? um, so I, I think that, that there was a good balance of plot and character development during that year, regardless of what, what, you know, it's like, if you watch, if you watch um, pretty in pink or, or, breakfast club it's the same thing where and you know like there's a lot the character you really get to know the characters but then you're laughing your ass off or you know same thing with with star wars you really get to know those characters but then you also get excited to watch them chop each other up with lightsabers you know um right. and, and karate kid you know like half of that movie is daniel getting his ass kicked and then and then what he when he's doing the ass kicking it's like you're really really invested at that movie, you know what i mean Right. right. Um, I am mostly out of questions. Uh, I did want to do another round of verses. Did we do this on your interview? Oh, yeah. We, we, you, you hit me with a hard one last time. What yeah, was you hit, it? You hit me with um, antiheroes versus Templars. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's a rough one. Which, which actually wasn't that tough for me, but, but I did. But people, people were a little bit. It's, it. it's super easy for me. I mean, there's like not even a question about it, but yeah. um, I get when people are, are, are have trouble with it. I completely understand. Sure. Um, but I have a new, I have a new round for you. Ready to go. I'm ready, dude. All right. Start with a softball. <laughs> <here. shit. laughs> actually, these might not be softballs. We'll do the music ones first. Okay. Blood, for, blood for blood. Or slap shot, slap shot. It's like not even a question, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love Blood for Blood. I, I grew up seeing Blood for Blood, uh, and and you know the the first few Blood for Blood records. Living in Exile is my favorite, but the the other two that came before it, I love. Wasn't so into the last two Blood for Blood records. Um, I get that. Yeah, yeah, I like Outlaw Anthems a lot. I like that a lot. But uh, people that don't like Serenity, I I'm not mad at it, but I get it. It's not great. They've aged better. They've aged better. But you know, when 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 uh, when 
I think it was Serenity. When it came out, like I literally laughed out loud, not not because of the funny shit he was saying, but because of how how they sounded. You know, like what the fuck? You know, right. like this is this is the band that made Revenge on Society. You know, <laughs> right, right. All right. How about this one? Cockney Rejects, the business, the business. Uh, the first two Cockney Rejects records are amazing. You know, you can't, and they are the Godfathers of Oi. There's, Cockney Rejects are the center of the first wave of Oi and everything that came out of it. But the business, to me, like they were on a different level in terms of the subject matter that they were singing about, um, and and they had so many good records. You know that. Um, I, I like their '90s records, you know, um, but and and just just as someone that's looking for for some 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 level of deepness or some level of meaning in in lyrics, you know, that the, the business were pretty they they could get pretty serious, you know, uh, like out for in the sure. cold, but out in the cold or nothing left to say. I'm sorry, one thing left to say. Like those songs are tear jerkers, you know. Uh, yeah. Out in the Cold is, yeah, that's a mind-blowingly good song. I'll even put this to you. It's the business for me, too. I like Stinky a lot as a personality, and I like him. Just He's a goon. Uh, his book is amazing if you get a chance to check it out. But great book. And so much respect. So much respect because you don't think of them as being as being serious, but they when they needed to be serious, they fucking got down. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the business, I will even say, not only do I like their 90s records, I think that they, I feel they are the only Oi band who their records got better as they went. Hardcore Hooligan is an untouchable record front to back. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that they, they, they are, the first records aren't very good and they got better. I'm saying those records were incredible and they evolved and it worked. They're, you know, they kind of, they kind of lost me for a little bit. I, I was not when the, I hated that song Guinness boys. I thought that was the cheesiest. The oh, cheesiest. I fucking loved it. I loved it. <laughs> Everybody loved that song. Man. I could not say, but you know, uh, the last release that they put out was, uh, was a, a seven inch. Um, I that right here. Uh, anyway. yeah, uh, this record, this this uh, back in the day, seven inch. This was the the A side of this uh, of this record was the best song that they'd done in decades. You know, like so. So I I, I would be that they were they still had some some vitality even at the very end. Absolutely, can't argue that at all. Um, Let's see. Let's. Oh, I got it. Here's here's one. Throw you off a little bit. Ghosts or UFOs? Ghosts. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so here's the thing, dude. Like, I'm not. It's no secret. I believe in ghosts. I'm fascinated by ghosts. I didn't ever. I was never given the choice between believing in ghosts or not. You know, what I mean, like they're fucking at a, at a young age. That was that stuff was knocking at my door. You know, like <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. As an adult, not so much, but you know, um, I, I I have seen things in my life that that anyone that was there could not have explained. You know, they could have said you're jumping to a conclusion by saying since it can't be explained, it's the ghost. You know, I can I can under, I can appreciate that perspective, but they still wouldn't have been able to explain why they why these things happen. You sure. Know what I mean, so, sure. No, nah, that's very cool. Um, I, I mean, I've got a handful of stories from when I was a kid too. I, I completely get that. Um, let's do okay. Uh, Fargo or the Big Lebowski? I'm, I'm a Big Lebowski guy. If I have to go between, go between the two. I'm not Big, Big Lebowski is 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 very uniquely funny, and and uh, I I like that. I like that more lighthearted to it you know so i think i'm with you on that um it's more quotable it's i think there's more laughs per capita in big lebowski as well all right yeah. last one <laughs> last resort or the foreskins well i 
I would have to say the foreskins. Um, I don't know that the foreskins had any record that was as consistent as the last resort polling, but they had the foreskins didn't have a bad record, you know, um, and and they had several of them, and uh, and some of those songs like um, Chaos or Clockwork Skinhead or Plastic Gangsters, yeah, I like I like the foreskins with every singer that they had. Um, and, uh, some, some of their lesser known songs are really, really underappreciated. That, that song, uh, Brave New World, that was, um, I think it was the, yeah. the, uh, the one law for them single. Oh, yeah. Dude, that's, the drums in that song fucking are just re- relentless, <laughs> you know, I and they were so fast for their time, dude. There was like, there's no, there's no band in England that was playing that, that fast. And there's been very few boy bands in general that have been as fast as the four skins or as aggressive. Right. That's, and actually that's the reason that they're my answer as well. They have more classic must listen skinhead anthems um, yeah. than any other band really um, from that era. I mean, I mean, there's yeah. chaos. Evil is maybe the greatest Oi song ever written quite honestly. Um, and then yeah, clockwork skin and all that shit, but one law for them, that is a blistering punk rock song. And like you said, super yeah, fast, no oi bands played like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I may be wrong, but my, my timeline might be a little bit skewed, but I think that that was before discharge got fast too, you know? Um, so I, I think that not only were they faster than every other skinhead band, they were faster than the most punk bands <laughs> you know i think they were faster than than probably every english punk band yeah because discharge didn't get didn't speed up and the verrukers didn't take their cues until what 82 right right yeah so yeah i uh, think you might be right yeah that's that's heavy man so okay we can we can wrap her up i think um do you where can where can fo- I mean everyone can find your record on uh, Spotify I think Apple Music um, where can they buy a physical copy if they want one So as of tonight while we were doing this interview I believe that it went live on our big cart so you can order directly from us um, by the end of I would say by next week should be able to order it from Longshot Music if you're in Canada or on the East Coast. Um, if you're in Europe, I don't know how many European listeners you have, but um, actually we have a few. We just found out the other day, quite a few. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the main the main label that um, that you know initially put it out is um, Try and Stop Me Records, and they have they they uh, this morning, this morning in America, this evening <laughs> in Europe, they they put up the record. So sure. uh, then in, in another few weeks, um, it should be on Pirates Press and. Uh, and revelation so oh very cool you're on rev and pirates press that's a, that's one of those things where i would feel good about myself at the end of the day just being distributed by those people yeah yeah i mean that's that's one of the best advantages to um to long shot you know long shot's a great label to begin with but also also that having that that clout you know that makes it a huge difference you know, uh, absolutely easy to get on Absolutely. Fantastic. And so um, to get from you to your big cartel, is there a link on your Instagram, which is at criminal outfit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, Man, is it around Long Beach? Um, if we want to figure out some kind of social distancing way to, to get the, the record, I, I have copies too. And there should be copies um, very soon at Dead Rockers on 4th Street too. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm going to be coming through there to get down to San Diego in the next sometime. Maybe I'll hit you up and, and swing by on the way through and pick up a copy from you. I'm going to, we're actually, we actually were planning on mailing you a copy. So after this, send, send me your, your address. And we'll email you Fine. Then I, I can't live with that. I'll, I'll send you something back then. <laughs> All right. This, my man. Interview you done with us, dude. You were the first person, first person to do an interview with the band. So, you know, fucking props to you, dude. And, and, and thanks so much for me for taking the time to do this site. Absolutely. Anytime we, we, we love you guys. And, uh, 
I mean, this this whole culture is about about helping each other out. So I'm I'm right there with you. I'm super stoked to see the progression of the band. Oh, wait a minute. I was going to ask you one more thing. Um, you got a new bass player, right? You had one lineup change. Yeah, yeah. So Willie, the old bass player, still played on the record, um, but basically, like in the studio, told us that uh, that he was going to have to move on. So um, he he committed to finishing the record with us. And Blake, um, Blake did the layout for our record. He did the, the, um, the artwork that's like, you know, the, the last resort skin end, but our, our take on that. He, he was the one right. that did that. And he's always been hanging out. So, um, you know, when we found out that he was a, a good bass player, we were pretty stoked, you know? So having him in the band has been a lot of fun. We miss, we miss Willie, but, but Blake is just, you know, we, he comes to practice so stoked all the time you know and, and we're so stoked to see him so uh really really excited to have him on board now so that's always good buddy you know yeah that's awesome and i'm glad to hear that there's no heat with with your man you know it just amicably split ways and you got it sorted out yeah i mean he's just he's just a busy dude you know and, and props to vis Bires, you know like that's that's a great band and uh and he's he's still playing with them and and they're going to continue doing awesome stuff. And, um, and you know, like a, he was in Beast Berries first, you know, and, and that's actually how I got to know him. So, yeah, definitely. No no bad blood. You know, he's he's a brother. So. I like that. I always like to hear that. It's been it's been a pleasure to talk to you again. We're going to have to talk like normal people, not just on an <laughs> interview at some point here in the future. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah we, there doesn't have to be a video camera on for us to talk. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, my man, Ditch, thank you again for coming around and, and talking to us about what's been going on. All the best to you in the future. And hell, I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, brother. You take it easy, All man. Right. Cheers.